All right, welcome to my talk today. My name is Art van Scheppingen. I'm a database engineer at MessageBird. And the topic of today is sharding. And we had the opportunity to do one of our own sharding solutions created ourselves. And then we had another project where we um, were testing an out of the box solution called VTES. And we were able to compare the two of them and draw up some conclusions and share that with you to help you out make the choice or prevent you from making the same mistake as we did. Um, so let's get started with this um, with this talk. So first of all, I'm going to explain a little bit about my employer, MessageBird. Then I'm going to uh, give you a short primer on sharding. And this is necessary to understand the other uh, two projects that are about sharding, because otherwise you wouldn't know exactly what we are doing and why we're making certain decisions. Uh, in the end, I'm going to compare the two of them and then draw up a couple of conclusions. So first of all, who's my employer? My employer is MessageBird, and MessageBird is a cloud communications platform that allows, for instance, businesses to send uh, messages to consumers or to other businesses. And they do this via sending messages to our API, and then they have the choice to send an SMS or uh, the Telegram or uh, Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp messages. Um, but in addition to that, we also have uh, ready-made solutions like Inbox, where we combine these messages as an, an basically like a Gmail, where you have all the communications via all different channels integrated into one Inbox. Uh, and we also have something called the Omni uh, Channel Widget, where it allows you to uh, reach out to your customers via their preferred uh, channel. So that could be SMS or Facebook Messenger, if they like. Uh, the company itself has been uh, founded in 2011, and it's Amsterdam-based company. However, we have offices all over the world to reach out to our global customers. Our customers are all over the world. We have about 20,000 customers. And that also means that we have a lot of offices in the world and a lot of employees. We have about 350 employees. And we're obviously looking for more because we are still expanding. Um, we're looking for a database engineer, for instance, but also infrastructure engineers, developers, and voice engineers. So there is a lot of uh, people that we're looking for. So if you're interested in a career at MessageBird, go and have a look. All right, with that out of the way, let's jump into our sharding primer. And this is just to ensure we're all on the same page. I know that a lot of you out there um, already know what sharding is, or you have worked with sharding, or you're even working on a sharding platform. But for the people that aren't aware, it's important that we explain this. So database sharding uh, is basically breaking up your database into smaller parts. And the reason for doing that is, for instance, you uh, have reached the limitations of your database. So that's like uh, it, it's uh, exhausted in CPU, the, the data size is too large, or even uh, things like replication are lagging behind. There could be reasons for performing sharding to have the workload spread over multiple databases and multiple clusters. It's not the same as table partitioning. Table partitioning, you have a large table that you want to break up in smaller pieces, but then it's on the same host. There are two types of uh, sharding that we can identify. That's functional sharding and horizontal sharding. Functional sharding is what most people begin with. So we can uh, split off a function from a schema that we have. For instance, we have the customers here. The customer table is uh, becoming too large. It's going becoming troublesome. So we just move that to another database and separate that from the orders. The downside is that the customer's table may not be reflecting uh, an even workload with the orders table. And that also means that database 01 and 02 are not scaled evenly. It could be the case that the customer's table is growing rapidly, or maybe the order's table. That's probably what uh, is more logical to happen. Uh, the order's table is growing rapidly, and uh, within half a year, you need to scale the database 01 a second time. Um, with sharding, you can no longer join the two tables. So the customer table cannot be joined with the order's table. Um, you have to do that with two separate queries. So you have to query uh, the database with customers information and the table with orders information. 
join that information in the application. Um, that is also a downside for data integrity, that those two are separated. You can no longer do foreign keys. That means that if you delete a customer from database O2 uh, in, in the orders table, the uh, orders belong to that customer still retain. So you, you basically have no more integrity. Horizontal sharding is the opposite of functional sharding. We do not take out troublesome functions, but we're basically trying to uh, move your data and spread it evenly over multiple hosts. And that also requires you to take the same schema and install that on each and every host. Doing that uh, requires something like an algorithm. You can do that on a piece of the data, like an identifier, cre creation date, or a geographic location to take as input to distribute your rows evenly over each and every database host. You can do that also differently with a, a, a separate database. So that's like a, um, uh, like a database where you store which row is stored in or which customer is stored in which database. Uh, the downside is that if that database becomes unavailable, your sharding environment no longer is accessible. You will no longer be able to get the data out. This schema allows you to scale evenly among each uh, of those hosts. And even if there is a hotspot, you should be able to move data around uh, in a certain way. Downside is you can no longer um, get, for instance, all the orders or all the customers at the same time because those are separated in multiple hosts. So you need to do multiple queries over each shard to get an overview of that. You may wonder why not do both. That's possible. Um, of course, you need to implement logic in your application to handle cases like this where you have uh, a functional shard and um, a, a normal uh, horizontal sharding. It has some uh, benefits, but there are hardly any uh, out-of-the-box sharding platforms that support this. Vitesse is one of them, um, but it requires a bit of uh, tinkering and uh, configuration to get it working. All right. Um, with that short introduction, let's jump into our own sharding solution and why we created that. On the question why we created that, we have to look at the typical database at MessageBird. You can see at the bottom, we have a primary and two replicas. They're replicating uh, asynchronously. And above that, we have three layers of service discovery. And then if you look at the top, we have the application connecting with a read-write connection uh, to a load balancer in, in our Google Cloud. That load balancer will then distribute the connections evenly over proxy SQL hosts. And those proxy SQL hosts then point to a second layer. And they do not do anything else than just point to the second layer. And that second layer then um, ensures that they're all pointing to the same primary. And this is basically where our failover logic happens. You can see on the right side, we have read-only connections going from the application, also going to the Google load balancer. But then the proxy SQL layer decides to immediately connect those connections or forward them to the replicas instead of to the primary. Now, if we look at the problem statement we were looking at. We're, we're having a short-term storage database for a particular uh, message type where we are receiving a lot of requests via our API. <clears throat> Excuse me. And those um, API requests end up with messages in our, uh, in our queues. Those queues are picked up by workers. And all those workers basically work in parallel sending those messages off and persisting them into this short-term storage. Now, our primary is able to cope with the load because all the workers are sending queries in parallel, but our database replicas can't keep up because they are a single-threaded MySQL replication. Um, as this is all stored in a single table in a single database, we are not able to uh, do parallel replication on um, uh, on this matter. 
also scaling up is no option. Uh, we're in the Google Cloud, so there are no faster CPUs. That doesn't allow us to scale that. And even if we would be able to get faster CPUs, it wouldn't help much because we have a 40% year over year growth to account for. And that means that within a couple of months, we probably already are back into replication lag. So we decided to think about our possible solutions that would be write less data, write our data smarter, enable parallel replication, I mentioned that before, and shard our data. It's not possible to write less uh, because of GDPR, we need to encrypt all our messages. And that means that we cannot gzip it. Uh, we cannot uh, make the messages smaller. Uh, we cannot write smarter. Uh, that requires a code overhaul and create some sort of worker that accumulates all uh, persistent uh, persistency and then do that in a multi-insert. And that's a lot of you know, um, single points of failure that you're creating. Uh, enable parallel replication, yes, that would be possible. But then as our database cluster is running in mixed mode uh, and we want to do a seamless um, uh, migration, this is not possible. That, that requires basically downtime and we, we would require to uh, create a new database uh, cluster. So why not put our efforts in uh, sharding our data and doing that same database migration uh, at the same time? in a seamless way. And this was basically the most sane option that we could choose. So how did we start sharding our data? Our, our messages have a, a UID as their unique identifier. Um, we could easily use this as our shard key, basically uh, access path for uh, this short-term database is stored by a UID, retrieved by a UID. So it's it's quite easy to, to do it in this way. Um, the UID also allows us to do random data distribution. It's quite good. And we decided to open up a connection for each and every shard. And then based upon uh, an algorithm on the UID, we would write to the shard or read from the shard. Now, that algorithm basically is quite similar to our UID mode low, the number of shards that we have. And um, that also Im implicates that if we want to change this algorithm, for instance, if we need to add new shards, our algorithm will be changing. So it's important for us to have a uh, validity within this algorithm. So we have a definition of the algorithm with a start date and an end date. End date is optional. If there's no end date, it's still infinity. So that's the most recent uh, algorithm. Um, this allows us then to switch algorithms when, whenever we want. Um, the start date and end date are basically the validity of the timestamp within the UID. So if we have uh, data that has been written in the past, um, we take out the timestamp and we can easily identify within which algorithm it's valid. There's also something else we have to take into account. We have a data retention of 10 days in this database. We have daily tables, so each and every day we uh, can change the schema, uh, we can do algorithm changes. We can also do algorithm changes on the fly, by the way. Uh, and also because we have only data retention of 10 days, shard splitting is not necessary. So going back to that typical database at MessageBird, um, if we want to implement our sharding solution, we want it to keep as much similar or the same as possible. In our environment, we just copy pasted all existing rules in, in proxy SQL for a cluster and then implement that multiple times for each and every shard in our environment. And I omitted the read only connections here, but they're still present in the sharding environment as well. Now, how does that look from the application side then? The application connects to our service discovery layer here, uh, collapsed and, and displayed as uh, some sort of cloud. Uh, for the application, it's like just pointing to the Google Load Balancer using a specific account, and then it just connects to the correct shard. Uh, for the application side, we have multiple connections open at once, and that also means that we can have, for instance, a shard that becomes unavailable. Um, in this case, uh, if the entire shard would be down, that, that's like a highly unlikely uh, scenario. And that's not what we took into account. What we took into account was 
if a primary would be down. And then normally we would immediately fail over using orchestrator, um, but there's always like a gap between failure detection and failover. So during that time, what are we going to do? Well, our existing data inside those uh, shards, um, if the primary is unavailable, updating would not be possible. Uh, however, we can still read the data from a replica. And if we can still read data from a replica, we can identify that we have existing data. If we have new data that would normally be inserted, uh, we recalculate our UAD. And recalculating that UAD uh, means that there, it's probably going to end up on a different connection. If it doesn't, it recalculates again. Um, this means that we can easily divert messages from, uh, or divert them, messages that would have been written on a broken chart, we can easily reattach them to another chart. And that means that now this new UID is valid for this message. So the UID on the message will change, uh, but that's not an issue within our systems. So in theory, we should be able to store all messages that we uh, need to. Did that work out as we planned? Well, of course, we had outages happen. Like I said, it's highly unlikely that the complete chart is unavailable, but that happened. Uh, what did that mean for us? That meant that uh, because we weren't able to read uh, data from the chart, we identified all existing data as new data. And of course, then you get the UID recalculation and the data gets duplicated in the system. So that was quite difficult to cope with. Um, we also had an issue with the sharding algorithm where we accidentally created a gap between the two valid algorithms. This resolved automatically, of course, because that gap ended, uh, but still it got us into a very weird uh, situation. Then we had the issue of UUID recalculation where the UUID, um, it, it, it's not free to recalculate a UUID or generate a UUID. And that meant that when we had not only one primary down, but two primaries down, it meant that about half of our shards were down and half of the shards were recalculated. And then our Kubernetes cluster started to get a little bit busy on the UID uh, recalculations. So that was also something you we had to take care of. Uh, in terms of scalability, it offers a scalability, but it requires a lot of changes in Proxy SQL and also uh, code change and the code deployment. Proxy SQL is then lifting the heavy load. So it, it, for each shard that we add, we add a number of connections in addition. So that's also something we are now working on. Can we reuse this for our other sharding solutions? Not all of them. It's very specific on the UID. So it's not a template for other data types. Also, a more permanent data like, um, <clears throat> let's say, uh, long-term storage is a bit, bit more difficult to maintain because then we need to, uh, well, we, we have uh, operational sides like shard splitting or we have hotspots to fix. And in this case, we don't have to do that. Uh, also, shard, cross shard querying is not possible or, or joins is not possible. Um, and that also means that we have a couple of downsides in this system. That brings me to uh, the, the second uh, sharding solution that we implemented, um, basically replacing our archive. So we have a midterm storage, which is used uh, for a couple of reasons. So we have the short term near real-time monitoring of routes, which happened on this midterm storage. We have quick reference for messages less than seven days old, and everything older than seven days is being shipped to our archive, which is a very slow Cloud SQL box. Um, replication lag on this midterm storage meant that uh, we are not able to fail over anymore, so we cannot uh, uh, ensure that the data is retained. Neither uh, can we do uh, read scaling based upon this. So that this is like a, a double problem. We decided to split up or split off the real-time data to isolate a problem to a different database. And then all the referencing should be done on one big archive. And then because it's big, you need to do sharding. So we identified that uh, we only need to fetch messages by a UAD, uh, customer identifier, or within a certain date range. And um, 
that allows us to identify the data that we need to uh, uh, need to index and how we need to make that accessible. There are also a couple of very simple aggregations that were necessary, like how many messages were sent by customer X or by uh, handled by route X, but everything else is offloaded to analytics. So why did we consider Vitesse then? Well, Vitesse promises to solve all the issues or all the things that we discussed before. And in addition to that, it also allows you to do materialized views, which are basically allowing you to do data duplication or creating data aggregates. Also, MySQL uses my, uh, Vitesse uses MySQL as a foundation, which makes it easier for us to transition to this because our company is doing like almost everything in MySQL. So that's also being a good test bed for future migrations or future sharding that we want to do. Uh, and that's also why we chose to go ahead with this. Uh, we had to make a choice why, whether we would take Kubernetes or a virtual machine install. Um, Vitesse uh, recommends using Kubernetes, uh, but we decided to go for virtual machines because then we can retain a larger data size. This is the typical setup within Vitesse that we decided to uh, also take. We have the VT gate host at the top, which is pro uh, service discovery comparable to proxy SQL, shards at the bottom, and then a control uh, set at the right side. What did we encounter during this proof of concept? Well, we found out that shard performance wasn't always up to par, but that was mostly due to MySQL not being tuned. So we had to tune it to our own setup. Uh, also, Vitesse needed tuning, uh, gRPC thread pools or connection pools uh, need to be sized as well. And if you don't do that, you will uh, lose a lot of performance if you need it. We needed to put Vitesse in production. So we need automation via Ansible. We need to implement it or integrate that into Prometheus, integrate backups. It's not a whole lot of work, but it's a workload you need to do. Then we need to get familiar with Vitesse, like administration with chart splits and schema migrations. And that's also all new things you have to learn. Now, if I would compare Vitesse to our own sharding solution um, from the database engineering point of view, our own sharding, we are in control. We define our shards. We define exactly which hosts are going to be used for what. Um, so for us, it's more like we are in control. For Vitesse, we rely now on a, on a framework. And that means that uh, Vitesse is a black box for us. We do not have a lot of control on Vitesse itself. We just configure the host, um, let them announce themselves to Vitesse, and then they are automatically assigned to uh, the correct uh, key spaces and the correct shards. How do developers then perceive uh, this, first of all, the uh, do-it-yourself shards, uh, there's a fear of change here. Um, they're a bit afraid that if they change anything in that algorithm, it could break our shards. And it, of course, it did happen in the past. And of course, during deployment times, you get issues. And that before you have the next deployment done and can fix your issue, it takes a while. So there's a fear of change here. While for Vitesse, there's a fear of unknown. They don't know how Vitesse works or if it's proven, how should they handle their queries because they're not all of them are supported. Uh, but this is more or less like um, you can train that, you can learn that. It's, it's not something you can't overcome. If I would look at the operational side of uh, the two uh, in the schema changes, it's um, everything handled in our own shards is done by the application. So I don't care about that schema change. So for me, it's it's perfect. While for Vitesse, um, that's not possible. However, Vitesse supports multiple schemas in, over multiple shards. And that also means that you can run online schema change on them. But online schema change, doing that on eight shards is a lot of work and it takes a lot of time, especially if you have like uh, 500 gigabytes to a terabyte of data to change. Scaling out, um, you would say that, that they're quite even, but for the do-it-yourself shards, of course, we need a lot of preparation up front. We need the deployment and we need to uh, hope that everything is fine. Uh, while for Vitesse, we just deploy a couple of new hosts. 
we, they announce themselves to Vitesse. The They're available immediately. So we can initiate the shard split. It takes a couple of hours or maybe a day. And then we can move our reads and writes to the new shards or roll back if necessary. But it's, it's less work. If we look at the operational side of MySQL backups, uh, we have, um, it, it's almost equal. We have to upgrade the, the hosts. We have to do a switch over and upgrade the primary. Um, for both of them, it's the same. However, if we would have done Kubernetes side of Vitesse, we would easily have been able to deploy those hosts automatically with a new MySQL version. So Kubernetes will save you a lot of work. Similarly, similar story for the, the platform upgrades uh, for Vitesse. We all have to do that manually now. If it would have gone for, uh, for Kubernetes, we would have been able to deploy new ones with the new version. In conclusion, I know I'm a bit uh, against uh, near the end. Uh, in conclusion, we um, are happy with Vitesse, definitely are happy with Vitesse, but uh, we should have gone with Kubernetes from the start. It will take far, more, far less work operational to do uh, Kubernetes than to do with virtual machines. However, the, the, the virtual machines allow us to do a larger data size. So that's, that's the benefit. And we have a less steep learning curve here because I'm not a Kubernetes expert. And then of course, I don't have to learn that. In, in hindsight, it's regrets. Is Pita saving you time? Uh, I would say yes and no. Um, of course, the lead time is way longer with Vitesse. So there's a lot of investment that you have to do, have to learn Vitesse, how to work with it. Uh, but it gives you a lot of flexibility. If you have a simple sharding problem, take a simple sharding solution. Do not go for Vitesse unless uh, you really want to use it massively. If you think you're going to have like more than one Charlotte cluster, definitely go for Vitesse. It's way easier, less hassle. If you only have one problem, just solve it simply. That's basically my recommendation. And that's also the end of this presentation. Uh, thank you for watching. And uh, yeah, of course, there's room for questions now. And um, let's, get, let's get into that.